Open your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 5 is where we'll be, our message will begin. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 5. And uh, have you ever used that phrase, the best laid plans of mice and men? Have you used that? Yeah, you have. Uh, and uh, do you know where that comes from? What's that? Oh, 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 ah. It comes from, yeah, it comes from the Steinbeck. It, actually, we think it comes from, that's, you're quoting Steinbeck. Right. Yeah, uh, the grapes of wrath and, or, or of mice and men. About, of my, and I can't, I can't remember now. Did anybody ever read of mice and men? Ever read that? Yeah, okay. It's, it was required reading, I think, for me. Uh, did you enjoy it? Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and we saw, I, I know, I think I saw the movie or most of it or whatever before. But you know, it comes from that little phrase, the best laid plans, plans of mice and men, comes from actually a poem from Robert Burns. And uh, it's, its titled is, To a Mouse. And uh, the interesting thing of that poem, and, it's, and uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to look it up on the internet and try to read it, uh, or listen to it read in the, in the brogue that it's written in. But the guy is plowing a field, and he runs over a mouse nest. And so he writes a poem about the mouse, and he's talking about the mouse's plan to winter in the field, the farmer's plan to get the crop planted. And uh, we have these, these plans that go awry. Well, I had an experience just a couple of weeks ago of, uh, uh, and I don't, in, the, in the circle there, you might see, this is the tree in my backyard that is now down. And there was a mama flying squirrel in the tree. You don't see many, you don't, any of you ever seen a flying squirrel other than in a cage? Yeah, yeah. A tree cutter would, right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, she had a nest full of babies, and hopefully they're surviving. And, I, you know, they were taken to, a, taken to someone that might care for them. But, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, I had plans for to get rid of my tree. The, mo the squirrel had plans to raise her family. And then, anyway, I should, uh, there's a poem right there. Did you catch that? <laughs> anyway. Uh, but anyway. Uh, no matter, but no matter if we're farmers or mice or trees, tree cutters or squirrels or whatever, uh, we're all subject to changing plans, aren't we? I mean, uh, it, you know, I don't know if you can think of something that hit you recently, but uh, anything hit you recently where your plans were changed abruptly? You had directions, uh, you were going to go this direction and something changed and you know, and uh, things, things happen in life, don't they? And, and uh, you know, it happens even for the Apostle Paul, there were plans that changed. There were situations that came up that altered his plans, altered his desires, altered what he was, what he was expecting. And part of that is what our context is about. So I hope that you're encouraged today that you will that you'll draw from this, you'll draw from this passage uh, some principles and some truths about the will of God in your life. I hope you can draw from that as we look at these situations. And uh, one of the key things that the apostle was what mentioned here in verse seven, he says, "If the Lord permits, if the Lord permits." You know that same wording is used in Hebrews chapter six and verse three. This is scattered throughout the scripture, this concept, this idea that, and, and probably where, where we would, you know, get the, get the idea that plans don't always work out. Things don't always go the way we would like them to go. Proverbs chapter 16, uh, verse 9, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Interesting. Have you ever experienced something like that? Proverbs 19, 21. There are many plans in man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. So regardless of what we plan, God sometimes has a bigger plan and a, and a better plan is what we ought to, that's where we ought to arrive. James 4.15 is often quoted, if the Lord wills, or if Lord willing and the, the creek don't rise. Okay, you know what? 
Do you know there's an argument about that? There's an argument about the creek uh, because somebody capitalized the word creek and they thought it was, they think it's, and they'll defend it, that it's the creek Indians. It's not about the water. Interesting. So anyway, I, I'll, let you, I'll let you wrestle with that one, but you hillbillies all know it's, uh, it's the water. Anyway. Yeah, but anyway, go back to history where that arose, where that, uh, where that arose. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway. Uh, but Lord willing, James, uses, James says that we ought to use that phrase, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills. What did Jesus do when he was in the garden? From the human standpoint, from the human standpoint, he pleaded with God, if you be willing. So even then he's submissive, if you really think about it. If, if you will, let this cup pass from me. And then he says, not mine, but yours, Lord. You know, as we pray, we can, we can tell the Lord what we want, but it ought to always be Lord willing. Lord, if it's in your will, this is my desire. So we can give the Lord our desires, and we can, but we need to come with submission in our hearts. And so I like this phrase. Lord willing, and the saints don't rise. <laughs> All right. Lord willing, and the saints don't rise. We are going to, in these next few moments, examine 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 5 through 12. And we're going to look how Paul shared about his plans and the plans of others as they related to Corinth. As they related to Corinth. So let's look at this context, picking up in verse 5. Follow along if you would. Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend, oh, it may be, hmm, and spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. Look at the undecidedness in this whole thing. Verse 7, for I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. Everything he's doing, it, it, it's just in the Lord's hands. Verse 8, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. So here's my plan. For a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does, he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. I think there's a lot behind that. And then in verse 12, now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. And so back up with me and and we're going to look at this context, and, and I, I, want you to, I want you to think in terms of these guys as being real people. I mean, you know, we can kind of, oh yeah, that's Paul, Apostle, and we read about him all the time, and remember, you know, and we, we, kind of, we kind of sometimes distance ourselves from this. But these are, these are real people in real situations, and, and uh, no, they didn't experience car breakdowns, and no, they didn't have delays in the airport, and no, they didn't. But they're real people with real situations and real changes that affect their lives. And how did they approach it? How did Paul approach this? And, uh, and I think we can gain from this. It also includes, you know, as, as maybe one of our plans change, plans of others change as well. You know, if we go this direction, we're not going to go this direction. The people we meet here are not going to be the people that are over here. Or there's all sorts of, <laughs> sorts of things that, that go on. But these are real people with real situations. And so in verse 5, Paul promised to come. He's going to go to Macedonia. He's going to go through Macedonia. And uh, several, several uh, of these slides will have a map on them just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Ephesus is down here, and uh, Paul's talking about coming up to Macedonia and then dropping down to Corinth, down here. He's talking, and uh, I don't know if he's going to go by land or by sea. Uh, he doesn't give us those details, but we see that's, that's Paul's plan. I'm going to go to Macedonia. I mean, he seems so determined in this. 
He's very determined in this, but again, we've got to keep verse 7 in mind when we, look, when we think about this. Uh, why would he want to go up here? Why would he want to go up here to Macedonia? Well, because of these towns that are mentioned there, Berea, Thessalonica, Philippi, those were places where there were brethren. There were, Paul had this drive in him to encourage the body of Christ. That's why he's going to go in the, to those places. And of course, Corinth is in mind. As we look at these chapters, he's going to drop down to Corinth and, uh, and uh, maybe spend the winter with them. And we already pointed out as we read it how that there's kind of a, an iffiness in this context. And I spent a lot of time this week reading over the book of Acts carefully, looking where Paul went and looking what happened. And uh, the, the, the timing of this letter is Acts, Acts 19 or 20, right in that context. And uh, in, when you read Acts 19 and 20, he, doesn't quite, he didn't quite make it. He gets down to, he gets down to Greece, which is interesting, and that's, that's over, over here. But man, shouldn't he have been able to go there? When we were over there uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we, we stayed in Athens and then drove a bus over to Corinth and, and actually beyond into some of this other region down south of there. But uh, it's not that far. You would think that Paul would have made it over to Corinth when he, when he spends uh, some time in Greece. But we don't know the circumstances and Acts doesn't record it. It talks about him being in Athens, but not down in, or being in, in Greece, but maybe not necessarily in Corinth. We just don't know some of those things. And, uh, and it's interesting that, that when you look at this context, when you read the book of Acts and try to compare this, uh, some of these things, uh, some of these plans may not have happened. I want you to turn over to 2 Corinthians just briefly, just a page away. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, look at Paul's attitude here. I think it just complements what we're talking about. In uh, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 15. And in this confidence, I, intend, I intended. See, here's that same idea. He had a plan to come to you before that I might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again to Macedon, from Macedonia to you and have helped you Anyway, the point is, he said, my intention was boom, 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 and it didn't necessarily work. I think we have a hint of that, that his plans in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians didn't come to fruition like he planned. And uh, again, I need to emphasize that verse 7. I'm back in 1 Corinthians 16. You know, uh, if the Lord permits. What does that mean practically? You know what? Practically, God allows, allowed Paul to use his brain. Practically, it allowed him to make plans. It allowed him to make adjustments for weather or whatever might happen. You know, uh, you know he's talking about winter there. But, but on the spiritual side, I think what we see consistently in Paul's life is that he stepped out in faith. He stepped out in faith and he expected the Lord. He said, Lord, I'm, I'm, I, I need to visit these people. I, my desire is to go there. I'm going to go in that direction. And he was allowing the Lord to direct his paths and even stop him if necessary. In Acts chapter 16, the only reason Paul got even over to this region, the only reason Paul got over to Philippi, Thessalonica, and down into Corinth eventually, is that the Lord directed him to Tro Troas. In Acts chapter 16, Paul's desire was to go, and it's not even on this map, but back over here to the northeast of Troas. He was coming from that, that eastern area. He wanted to go north. I'm going to go north. I'm going to go north. And what happened? The Lord stopped him. It says the Spirit directed him. The Lord, the Lord stopped him from going over there and put him in the town of Troas. Well, what's he going to do in Troas? Oh, I couldn't go north, so I'm going to just cry in my soup. No. You know, he's still going to be faithful to what God wants him to do. There is, and I, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself by saying this, but there is the revealed word of God that we are to be active in ministry wherever we, wherever we find ourselves. 
And so the Apostle Paul finds him there. He gets the Macedonian vision and the Lord directs him. But sometimes, sometimes God will stop your intention. Paul talks about intention in 2 Corinthians there. Sometimes the Lord will stop what you intend. But there is the revealed word of God as well. We need to keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, I, I think of that. Um, <clears throat> when I came to Tip City, it's been a while now. When I came to Tip City, I, I was dependent upon the Lord for open and shut doors. I was depending on that kind of a thing, that the Lord would open and shut doors, and uh, I wanted clear direction. And uh, I think I've probably mentioned this before, but with family on the west, I was thinking I should probably go west. My intention was. And I talked to some churches in the west, had a phone interview with a church in the West. Interesting how the Lord shut doors. I preached one time in the West. The Lord shut the door. I told you about that. The lady said, nice tie. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't about the great sermon. It was the nice tie. Anyway. <laughs> we won't go into detail there. I preached a powerful sermon, I tell you. But uh, anyway. But the Lord shut doors, and, and you know what? And I thank God for that. And the Lord opened doors in Tip City and just kept opening doors till, uh, hey, Jeff, quit looking west. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, it just, you know, how God worked. And I, I'm confident in that the Lord gave peace and the opportunity, but I was ready to go. I was ready to go, and the Lord opened doors, closed doors. Moving on in this context here, you also see that Paul said, and you can send me on my way. After the winter, after the, winter the Lord's going to send me, you guys can send me on my way. If you compare that to Acts 19.21, you know where Paul wanted to go? He wanted to go to Rome. His desire was to go to Rome. And maybe that was in the back of his mind. He doesn't detail that for us here. But in Acts chapter 13, when he and Barnabas were first sent out, the, uh, the church there, the church with the Spirit's direction, the Spirit was directing them, and the Spirit guided them, the Spirit uh, directed them, they prayed for them, they laid hands on them, and uh, I would assume, I would assume that uh, they actually gave him a little something to get going on as well. So Antioch's over here, Ephesus is here, Corinth is here. We know that the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul was ready to go. And uh, that first missionary journey didn't get all over there, but, but the point is that he was sent. The scriptures tell us he was sent. The spirit backed him, prayers backed him, the laying on of hands, that kind of a thing. There was physical, physical encouragement along the way. And he was sent along the way. Now, he says... He brings up Ephesus in this context, verses 8 and 9. And he said, after Pentecost. Well, I don't think Paul's worried about celebrating the Jewish, the Jewish uh, celebration of Pentecost. He wasn't going to go to Jerusalem. He's missed several trips to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And so that's not his point. His point is, is that gives us an approximate timing, approximate timing where, what Paul is talking about. Pentecost happens in the spring, 50 days after, after the Passover. And so you have, you know, sometime late spring that he's talking about when is this. And so what we have is that Paul's in Ephesus writing this letter, expecting after Pentecost to go. We have a hint that this gives us two ideas, the timing. Uh, so it's the spring of that year that Paul is writing this, this letter. And uh, it corresponds with his third missionary journey. And, uh, and we'll just leave it at that. But one of the things I want to mention, I want to, I want to bring it up again, is that here we have Paul dealing with, well, I'm going to, I will probably do this and I intend to do that. But all the while, he had the, the re revealed word of God or will of God in his mind. He wasn't just going to go to get a little son in Corinth. He wasn't going to go just to whatever. He had the intent based upon the revealed word of God. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, tells every one of us that we are in the ministry. Every one of us. That doesn't mean that every one of us preaches. But it does mean that each of us ought to have that same concern. And ultimately, in verse 16, it says, we're to build the body. We're to build the body. That might be a word of encouragement here as we're shaking hands. That might be, that might be contributions in the offering plate. That might be a hundred other things that we could talk about that, that builds the body of Christ. But that's our spiritual, our spiritual goal that God has revealed for all of us. So regardless of the plans, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of where we are at the moment, we still have the, the responsibility before God of, the, of, uh, of, of putting, ourselves, putting ourselves out there for the work of the Lord. I love what Paul says here in this context when he talks about an open door. An open door. He says a great and effective door is open. So Paul's in Ephesus wanting to go to Corinth, wanting to go to Macedonia, but he says, I can't leave yet. This ministry opportunity is so powerful. This ministry opportunity is great. And uh, the, the word for great is mega. It's great and it's effective. And uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity for ministry. I, I love the idea of an open door. You know, I mentioned it with the idea of God's direction, but Paul sees this door wide open. And because he has that drive and that desire and that, and that uh, connection with the revealed word of God, he is going through the door. He's going to go through the door as the door is open. All of us probably have had incidents where we kick ourselves afterwards and we say, I should have brought up something. I should have said something about Christ. I should have witnessed to that person. I should have whatever it might. Every one of us, I bet every one of us probably can kick ourselves about a certain situation. But Paul here is, says, the door's open. I'm going. I'm going through this. I don't know what he saw. I don't know what he saw. Maybe as you read, you ought to read Acts uh, 19 and 20 and just see what Paul was, 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 see the things that were happening in Ephesus. There was a spark of a revival that maybe he saw. I mean, they, there were so many people that left witchcraft because of Paul. And uh, they, they burned those books and, and then Paul gets in trouble. Notice what he says to, and there are adversaries. Adversaries. He almost looks forward to adversaries as much as he looks forward to the open door. What? I got trouble facing me. Let's go. I want to say, let's run. <laughs> you know, the other way. I mean, that's, you know, my human, that's human nature, isn't it? But Paul, he's looking forward to facing these adver adversaries. Why? There's probably a lot of reasons, but I, I thought of a couple. One of them is, is all who live godly, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. When you feel the pressure, when you feel the pressure, pressure of persecution, it confirms that you're heading the right direction. And then I thought of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. Listen to what, listen to what Paul says. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there and read it. 2 Corinthians, went too far. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. Paul says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You want to sense the power of God in your lives? It's not about a bunch of hype in a service sometime where, where you get all excited because the music gets you ranting and raving and you're ready. It's, it's about your failures, your weakness, your needs. And you cry out to God and say, Oh God, help me. Empower me. Enable me. When I'm weak, 
then I'm strong because God is working in me. Then God is working in me. It's not about what we can do for God. It's about what God can do through us. And God can do exceeding abundant beyond what we ask or think. And I think a lot of times we, we sell God short. When an opportunity comes up to be a part of what God's ministry is going on and we, I don't know if I can. That's right. You can't. You can't in your own power, in your own self. You can't really do things honoring to God on your own. The only way to honor God is allow Him to fill you and work in you. He doesn't get glory from our power. He gets glory from His power working in us. So what did Paul do with the open door? Charge! What do you see through the open door? Adversaries. But he still went and he charged that open door. What a great example. Here's another one. Timothy. Verses 10 and 11. He didn't even know if Timothy was going to get there. You know, he talks about Timothy might come to you, etc., etc. That was all in the Lord's hands. But he wanted them to be prepared. If Timothy comes, if Timothy comes, you know, you're not here by accident today. Some of these guys had to drive all the way from New York to get here. To, you know. <laughs> You're not, you know, none of us are here by accident today. I, I'm, I'm just confident in the Lord that, and, and it applies to those that might listen on CD or DVD or TV or YouTube or whatever it is. Anyone that hears this message, it's not an accident. It's not an accident. It's in God's hands. And so he tells these guys about Timothy. He says, don't scare him to death. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I was a little fearful as I first came to Tip City, but uh, it wasn't because of your, your faces or anything like that. It was just life, you know. I was in a big change of life to come here and to make a, make a move, you know, a thousand mile move, that kind of thing. But anyway, but when it came to, when it came to these guys, he says, don't, don't scare this guy. Is it because Timothy was somewhat timid? Was it because, you know, maybe today some psychologists could label him, oh, he has depression, oh, he has whatever it might be. And we might have some list, some label that we could put on him. Paul says, don't you, don't you as the body, don't you as the body create fear? And then I love what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 and 8. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Therefore, don't be ashamed. Fear and shame on one end, but God's power in the middle. Don't let that, you know, God, don't, don't dwell on the external. Look what God has given you. Then he talks about how legitimate that Timothy is. He's involved in the work of the Lord just like me. He talks about Timothy. I think Timothy would, uh, Timothy would be a good one to read our memory verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. That your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Timothy was Paul's right-hand man by the will of God, 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. He, he was Paul's fellow worker in Romans chapter 16 and 1 Thessalonians 3. He was an example of someone who had the mind of Christ in Philippians chapter 2, and that mind was expressed, and I love some of the things that he brings out. He says he's uniquely like-minded. He's one of a kind. He's like-minded with Paul. He's caring. He's focused. He's like a son to Paul, especially when it came to the gospel. Especially when it came to the gospel. When it comes to the gospel, I think we could say that Timothy was evidently sold out to the gospel like Paul. We have every, really, every reason to believe that he 
knew the gospel, he lived the gospel, and he preached the gospel. He would proclaim that Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again. Christ's death for sin takes away all sin. You're absolutely forgiven if you have your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the message I want to be, I want to be known for too. That the gospel is the core. It's the foundation. You know, we, we talk about some of these other things and trusting the Lord willing and all that kind of thing. You know what? None of that means anything. When it comes to the work of the Lord, none of that means anything unless it's built upon the foundation of the gospel. Unless you're truly trusting that Jesus Christ died for you, then all, everything else is meaningless. It's just a religion. It's just going through the motions. So I pray today that your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you. I pray that you understand that gospel. I pray that it has an impact in your life and that you live it. I thought of Galatians 2.20 in that regard. I'm going to try to quote it. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As Paul writes that, the foundation is the gospel. Christ lo God loved us. Christ died for us. It's all wrapped up in that idea. That's the foundation. Then, allowing Christ to live in you. Timothy's legit. Don't despise him, verse 11 says. Don't despise him. And uh, we don't know what that means. But these carnal Corinthians, they were so wrapped up in personalities. Well, you're not Paul. Paul would have said it different than that. You know, I don't know. They were wrapped up in personality ideas and, and they were, that was part of their carnality. Maybe it was just, oh, you're just a young punk. Maybe it is that Timothy, it was Timothy's youth. God told Timothy, don't let anybody despise your youth. Well, how do you avoid that? Some of you that are on the younger side of things. How do you, how do you avoid someone despising your youth? By being an example of what a believer ought to be. That's 1 Corinthians 4.12. Be what God wants you to be. And then send. Send him along. So in other words, if Timothy comes through, send him along because he's got, we, got, we got ministry to do. I think it just shows that, and by the way, he uses the same word he used for Paul back in verse 6. Send me along. If you guys will send me. He sent Timothy the same idea. Paul, uh, Paul had a mission and a ministry for Timothy. He talks about getting back together. Paul was waiting for him. It's just an emphasis on, on being purposeful and having a mission. Timothy wasn't just strolling around the country to see the world. It was a part of his mission. And then finally in verse 12, you see Apollos. I want you to turn to Acts 18 with me briefly. Acts chapter 18, verse 24. This guy, uh, this guy just gets me. He's just, he just amazing, amazing type guy. But here's Apollos. Let me read the first verse, verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately. The things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Huh. This guy's way out of date. He's way out of sync as to what God was doing. I mean, I put a dispensational chart on the, on the wall here. Uh, and if you think about, think about where this guy was, he's back here pre-cross. He's back here living under the law, talking about, uh, talking about what John says, repent and be baptized. He was very accurate as what he was saying, it says here. Very accurate. He was very eloquent. He could get a following. But he was missing the boat. He, he didn't even know about Christ's death yet. He wasn't even preaching the death of Christ, that Christ came. And he, was, he promised to set up the kingdom. He didn't talk about that. And then 
He missed the idea that God raised up the Apostle Paul, as we've been talking about in our uh, Bible school class, our Bible study class. You know, he missed the whole, the whole point of the dispensation of grace. He did, you know, he was, he was way off, back, off base. And then a couple of simple people, a couple of simple people, Aquila and Priscilla, talked to him. And uh, notice, uh, go down to verse 26. So when he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So he was accurate for what he knew, but he wasn't accurate as to what God had already done. And so what do you suppose these guys told him? They, they brought him up to date as to, as to the dispensation of the grace of God. They brought him up to date as far as the cross and how the cross, uh, the cross was really the answer. It wasn't about this Jewish thing and getting under the law and, and focusing on the kingdom. I mean, he was, you know, he had to bring him up to date. And for Paul to bring to Paul, for Paul to recommend this guy like this, it shows that he was he humbly submitted to that message. He humbly submitted to the message that Aquila and Priscilla had, and uh, and he was he was someone that Paul valued who preached the, preached the dispensation of grace, preached that Christ paid for their sin, preached that that we're Jew and Gentile are alike, and so many things today. He was he had to leave behind the emphasis on the law. He had to leave. He had to understand but leave behind that emphasis on the kingdom and recognize that we are in the body of Christ and that our hope is eternal in the heavens today and there's so much more that we could emphasize he had to understand the significance of grace for Paul to reckon, recommend, recommend him anyway Paul says I really want you to go to Corinth Paul says no what who would defy a great apostle you know, I think it just demonstrates that, that Paul says, I urged him, I encouraged him to go to, F, go to Corinth. And he says, I got something else I'm involved in. You know, I could urge you and encourage you to, to do whatever, you know. I, I can encourage you to do things. But I don't know what God's doing in your life. I don't know where your ministry might lie. And so you can tell me no. Lord willing. I won't tell you I know, I know better than God. But I will tell you you're responsible before God to serve Him and to follow His revealed will. So as we summarize this whole thing, I, one of the things that hit me right between the eyes is reading these guys we're just talking about three people and then the, the other churches and places. God uses people to reach people. God wants to use you. He wants to use you to accomplish His will and His, for His glory. He's not moving us around like puppets these days. He's not doing that. But He's giving you open doors for you to step through. Step out in faith and trusting Him. You know... And, and in the big picture, God works it all to the counsel of his own will. How does he do that? I can't explain it. But our God is that big and that great. God could use you even if you don't know enough, like he used Apollos. Just be open and humble to his word and his will. God can use you if your personality is Tim and Timothy. God could still use you. Let the gospel work in your life and you'll be amazed what God can do through you. God wants you to mimic Paul. What? I mean, none of us, none of us would say, man, I don't have the boldness of Paul. I, I would never, you know. But the scripture tells us clearly several places that we're to imitate him or people like him. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. Look for people that are kind of like Paul. Imitate what they're doing. Follow Paul like he followed Christ. Recognize 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 1 that Paul is the, the uh, pattern of those who are saved by grace. So whatever your plans might be, we make plans all the time, don't we? 
simple plans. Where are we going to eat? Where are we going to go? What are, you know, they might be close plans. They might be far plans. But I want to challenge you with the big plan. Have you ever really planned and determined to say, I'm going to be a Christ follower? I'm going to be a Christ follower. I know people say, yeah, but he might send me to the middle of Africa. You know, I don't know why people think that. You know, why we're afraid of that kind of thing. God's plan might be way different than you envision it. But if he sends you to Africa, or wherever he sends you, it's going to be the very best place for you. Right? Yep. <laughs> and we can rest assured that no matter, no matter how God changes our plans, how God redirects, how God stops, we can rest assured that being, where, being in his hands is the very, very blessed, best. So what are you planning? Are you willing? Lord willing? I hope so. Father, thank you for this passage of scripture and just how we see regular people who, who uh, you know, live life like us, but who are willing to be used of you. Father, may we plan to be willing. Lord willing. Amen.